Hey guys, welcome back to my church flip. Um, we are gonna be doing a drywall video today, but not just any drywall video. Today I'm gonna show you how to do a small project, like closing up a couple of walls, install it, tape it, sand it, prime it, paint it, all in the same day. All yeah, right? right. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> no, you don't think so? I bet you around the golf you're not gonna make that one. All right, all right, you heard it guys. Matt's in on this. Um, if I win, he's paying for my round of golf. Here's the deal. Uh, I've done this before. I've got a system and a technique. You don't have to spend a whole weekend or two or three weekends finishing off a project like this. I'm gonna give you the right t system, the right tools, the right techniques. You can do all of this in just one day. Let's get at it. Okay, so first step when you're doing a project like this is make sure your drywall is the right size. You wanna avoid any butt joints. And that's when you have the, the four foot side of the drywall up against another factory edge. You all know butt joints, they're extra coats and it takes extra time, okay? To make things speedy, buy the drywall the same length as your wall. In this case, I needed nine foot, which they do sell at Home Depot, or 10 foot, which they'll sell anywhere else, okay? So I've got some tens, and what I'm gonna do, first off, is I'm gonna do the top, and then work my way from the top down. So I'm gonna mark my four foot, plus an extra quarter, all right? And then I'm gonna install my cheating block. Now, having a cheap block like this allows you to lift your drywall in place, and then set it on the block to take the weight. And this is just temporary. Now, once you got your cheat block for carrying the weight, you want to take another block, okay? This is the best part. This block is going to be to make sure that the fly drywall doesn't fall over on your head. There we go. It's even more important than the one that carries the weight because when you're working with drywall, if you put a sheet like that and then someone opens up a door to a room and the difference in air pressure will pull it right off the wall, land on your head, that's no fun. That's, uh, that's experience talking. Next, we got our drywall and let's get hanging. All right, guys, here goes the challenge. It is quarter after 11 and my cameraman has gotta be out of here before. So I literally have just less than five hours to pull this off. <clears throat> Let's get the first 10 footer in place here. Now the reason I went with 10 footer is because I'm working alone, which means I can have it overhanging on both sides. I've got to avoid that dryer duct up there too, don't I? Hooyah! Come on, you little bugger, get in there. All right, need a little more length over here. Now I can switch out the screw gun. Got a new dimple bit I'm gonna use today. And I know, yeah, there are things like drywall screw guns out there, but I'm showing you a small project for a reason. Homeowners that do small projects don't buy $300 tools. So, $3 tool, okay? <laughs> now, step one, of course, is installing the drywall. I'm gonna recommend you get a bench like this. Even if it's an eight foot ceiling, it's nice to have that extra step up. And it's as simple as using an inch and a quarter screw on half inch drywall. That makes sure that your screws aren't longer than what code allows for the depth of a screw in a wall. So you don't puncture any wires or plumbing. Here we go. We're gonna lift this up nice and tight before we get going. Okay. Okay, and for everybody who doesn't know, we're just cutting the paper, just the tip of the blade, nice and easy. Come around the other side, all right? And then it just opens like a door. And then you cut on the, the crease that's created. Perfect every time. There's two schools of thought when you're doing drywall, if you have a, a longer wall. This is nine foot and a change, okay? So I couldn't use 254s. I'm still gonna have an extra joint. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take out all my stubs. All right. And then I'm going to actually put the next sheet on the ground. It gives me a reference point to measure up and over from, so I can pre-drill all these holes. I can slide it on, and then I can measure and fill in the gap. That's just how I prefer to work it, especially alone. I can't hold a 10-foot sheet one foot off the ground. I'm not gonna fuss around with that. Okay, so I'm just gonna measure over to the center of the pipe, 16 and an eight. And then from the ground up to the center of the pipe, we'll call it six and a half for every protrusion, even the electrical. We're gonna call that 39 and 23. 41 and a quarter. 28 and a half. 45 and a half. 28 and a half. 50, 
one in here. When you're dealing with uh, installing drywall, anytime you have an electrical box with screws extended, you gotta shorten them up. Can't roto zip a box like that. Okay. Look at that one, that one, that one, that one. This is the Swiss cheese of drywall. Oh my goodness. 56 and a half. And 17. Okay. This one's electrical. That one's electrical. 63 and 52. I don't think that's gonna, that's the next piece. That is definitely the next piece of drywall. Drywall's only 48 inches tall. Here we go. 81 and three quarters. And then this one is tricky because I've got a Y. So I'm actually gonna take the measurement to here and make a big oval and then patch it. Okay, 33 to 38. And then over here is nine inches. And I'm gonna just mark that from here. I'll be able to see that and know that there's an electrical box inside of that stud. What I'm gonna do is set my drywall up relatively where the end is so that I can visually inspect everything that I'm doing as well. First thing is first, translate all those measurements onto the board. <laughs> and from here it gets nice and quick. Okay, here's a great way to cheat because this drywall square has numbers going in both directions. So I can measure up from the ground to my spot. Okay, so I'm gonna go 16 and an eighth. And then my number was six and a half. Next number is 39 and 23. And here we go. This is an electrical box. 23 is here. That means I'll rotate zip after. My next one is 41 and a quarter, 28 and a half. 41 and a quarter, 28 and a half. My next one's over here, 81 and three quarters. Thirty-three to thirty-eight. Okay, oval. And then from here, this is the best. You can see here, this is nine inches down. Okay, I'm just gonna put the tape where the box is. Work down to nine. That's my electrical spot. All right, let's roll it. So the first one is an inch and a half hole. Okay, that's all my plumbing. Let's get that. Installed roughly now. Okay, now we do the electrical boxes. Now, this is a little bit too long for an electrical box. I'll tighten it up so that only this round tip is in the inside in case it hits a wire, it won't wreck it. That's what it is, my goodness. Uh, where's my drill? Ah! I wasn't paying attention. This box has built-in stops for the drywall. This thing was in my bloody way. Bad day at the office. All right, let's get that out of there. Okay. Back to the cutting. Okay, and then we have one over here. All right. Whew. Look at this, look at this. That is like right on the edge. I'll adjust that in a second. Okay, last thing I gotta do is cut this box out because it is a little bit lower than the top of the drywall.
All right, there we go. So that was a lot of screeching, but the point is, it makes quick work and it's pretty precision. Now when I'm done putting this sheet in, I'm gonna foam all those holes. Now, I can't reach to the bottom. The stairs cause me some issues. So I score the backside and I'm gonna just create this wet le ah, ridge here. Now you can probably see this on camera, okay? This thing right here, that ridge. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rotate it from the bottom up, cut that clean. Here we go. And now I can score it. Beautiful. Obviously, step one in a project like this is have the right tools. If you're not gonna buy a screw gun, get a rotor zip. Trying to do something like this by hand will drive you nuts. Here's the rest of my system. Don't worry about being perfect. You're gonna put on three coats of mud. You've got all the time in the world to fix this up and make it look pretty, okay? So we're just gonna take a little foam. Fill in the gaps so that when we go to mud, we can trim back the foam and bring the mud in to bring this up to speed so that the wall is nice and sealed. This will give us a phenomenal finished look. And, and this is a great trick that make any rookie a pro, especially here because we had to cut the oval. All right, boom. That's gonna make taping really quick and easy. Okay, last piece of drywall. We got two joints here. One of them is gonna be a uh, uh, tapered edge and the other one will be thicker. So we wanna put the thicker joint on the bottom because our eyes are at this level, generally speaking. Now, if everybody in your world is this short, then you go ahead and put the good joint down here. But here we go, 17 and three quarters. And that is gonna be smaller because I know it's not level. Yep. 16 and 3 eighths. Amazing. So I'm gonna go cut that piece of drywall and come over here and then we'll just roto zip out the box and we're done this wall. Uh, this is nine feet long. There's no real simple way to do this, but a chalk line will work. So we're gonna go with the chalk line on this one. There we go. Now, since that's a perfect measurement, I'm gonna cut just above the chalk line because in situations like this, it's easier to fill than to cut it all back. When you're working for speed, you don't wanna do anything twice. Okay, so this is a little tricky. I've got to get this installed. It's going to bow over top of this. And then afterwards, I'm going to route it out. Let's see if we can push that in for now. There we go. Come on, baby. What's the holdup? Oh. See, I went below the chalk line here. That's gonna cost you time and energy. All right. One wall down. Okay, now I'm gonna cut out that box. I'm gonna finish installing the drywall on the other side. Just, it's just drop it in, cut it off the excess. There's no protrusions. Well, before we go to time-lapse, uh, it is five to 12. First of all, it took us 40 minutes. Not bad. Well, that really sucked, eh?
just one area here that needs a little bit of love. I still need my drill for this piece. All right. Now that I'm done the other side, it's been 15, 20 minutes, we can trim off our foam, okay? Now, we just use a long full blade and I bend it. And there's no way this foam is cured completely by now, but if we expose the semi-cured in behind, it'll finish drying over the next 10 or 15 minutes. Ah, see, I got a little bit too much out of there. Oh well. I'm basically ready to tape here now. Using this system will give you really good results around rotor zip mistakes, electrical boxes, sealing up plumbing vents. If you're doing work in places where critters can get into the building, using the pest block works really good. That just makes taping so much easier. Right? All right. Okay, guys, here's my system for taping. Um, I'm using a hawk, four by 10, four inch knife. It's pretty much all I'm using today. And I'm gonna be using almost exclusively Sheetrock 45, USG 45, um, lightweight 45, whatever the product is. If it has four and five on it and it's drywall compound, that's the stuff, all right? So no matter where you're from. Basic paper tape, and I'm also using paper corners. This is the kind of corner that comes off and then you fold it and then you just apply it and we're done. There's no metal involved, and that is fine. Remember, we're going for occupancy and speed. So having to me cutting metal and screwing on corners makes no sense in this situation, because this goes like lightning. And I'm using air moving. Lots of air movement. It is hot and humid today. This is not an air conditioned environment. It's gonna actually slow me down, probably almost an hour in total, just because it takes so much time to get the moisture out of all of this when the air is so wet already. So hopefully we can still pull this off. But the idea is simple. I wanna mix some mud. I got my pail sitting here, ready to roll with my mixer. That's probably asking for trouble, but let's see if I can go nice and quick. Oh, and I should have got my slow mixer too. That's gonna be important. Now, I'm gonna use my DeWalt slow mixer. This is an amazing tool. It's good for mixing compounds, thin sets, cements, concretes, all right? If you don't have one, and you're gonna be a serious DIYer, consider getting one. You can't mix thin set with basic drills that you get for your, your home tools and power drills and batteries. Gonna blow your tools up, okay? So if you're gonna be serious about DIYing, get some serious tools. And I'm gonna just make about a third of a bag of this. And we'll see. We'll see what the water compound is like here and how it interacts with the compound. Everywhere you go, it's different. I'm using cold water for this batch. I might use warm water next batch, depending how long it sets up. But the salt content of the water and different minerals, everything like that affects it. So we're just gonna start off nice and soupy to get started. Make sure that we don't have any bridging. There we go, that ought to work. The goal here is creamy smooth. If it's not getting smooth enough, just add a little bit of touch of water. Let's check that out. That's actually not that bad. Just a drip.
Now, the reason I'm using this power mixer is because I don't have the luxury of time. If I use a smaller tool or try to do it by hand, I'm gonna end up wasting too much mixing time, putting too much air into it, killing too much off the clock. 45 relates to how much working time you have with the mud, okay? And so since there's not a lot of working time, we don't have time to fuss around. Ah, so now we're simply gonna load up our hawk and start applying tape as fast as we can. All right. Uh -huh. And we're gonna try to not be too messy, but at the same time, when you're dealing with the speed is the name of the game, a little bit mess isn't gonna hurt anybody. Okay. Ah, I don't like working messy, but. So we're just gonna fill and flatten. And we're gonna press our tape in. And then we'll put our corners on. And I got a little something different for the edges today because we're not using inside corner taping techniques. We don't have the luxury of inside corners when you're in a hurry. So we'll get to my secret for that in a minute. These laundry boxes have always got that little mounting bracket hardware that creates a protrusion. So you're gonna have to be aware of that and ready to deal with it. Always means more mudding, okay? Okay, here we go. Now we're ready to go. I'm gonna set it. Now we're going to bed the tape, work the bottom half, clean as you go. We're not trying to take the mud out from behind it. So you feel free to have it straight or even snow plowed towards it. We're just getting rid of all the excess, okay? When you're done bedding it, make it damp on the front, okay? That will eliminate any risk of bubbles. And bubbles in a situation like this will cost you another hour because you've got to repair them. Feel this stuff setting up already. Wow. Maybe we'll get lucky and have enough working time for me to finish all the taping. We'll see. I don't have the fans on right now either. <laughs> so the good news is at least we know the mud's gonna dry in enough time today. And since I know how to paint, I'm pretty confident I'm getting myself a free round of golf. He creased my tape for me, even though he's buying lunch. And a round of golf. <laughs> okay. Wicked. 
here we go. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna show you my technique. It's two parts. It's taping and then it's a special crown molding caulking we're gonna use. But instead of extending the work scope, we're gonna what's called flat tape up in the corners. It's just a process of adding mud and tape where you need to fill a gap, like right here. Okay, try to keep the other wall clean. There we go. Now, if your room is nice and square, you can get away with just caulking like we will at the top. But this area here specifically needed the extra help. All right. What this does is this gives me a flat surface to finish with. All right, and that's it. That's flat taping. And you can incorporate this in just about any job to avoid having to paint this side, right? I can sand this out and just wash any extra mud off the other side. I'm gonna do the same thing at the ceiling, so I'm not incorporating the ceiling with my paint job. This is how you keep the scope of work nice and small. Okay. So now you've seen basically my first coat. <laughs> we'll just kick in the time lapse and I'll catch up on the second coat. It is now 1240. I'm gonna finish the other corner and then turn on the fans, have a bite to eat. And this will all be dry up right after lunch. little bit of this mud left. It's almost done. It's starting to get stiff. I'm going to take advantage of that opportunity and fill all of my major voids over the next three to five minutes before it's too hard to use. We got to throw the rest of that out. And what I mean is, yeah, that's still got a little bit of stick to it. That's good. We're going to take the four by ten and run it a little tight and just fill all the gaps. Okay. This allows us to uh, uh, treat this like a fill coat right now. When you're working with regular drywall compound, you can't do this because it shrinks too much if you put too much on. But when you're working with the quick set compounds, you can do that all day long. Also means we can come along the corners and do a fill coat on the corners. Okay. And this isn't our final coat by any stretch. We're still going to do another bag of 45 and do another coat on top of all of this. That one will be mixed a little bit thinner. And then, see this? If you get junk in your mud, you got to get rid of it. Ah, mud, dirty mud is no good to you. Here we go. Well, this is not nice to work with right now, but it's still better than nothing. I hate throwing things in the garbage. All right, here we go. We're going to throw the fan back on because it is really hot. <laughs> I'm getting too old for this.
All right. Okay. A little late, but lunch is here. It's five to one. We're gonna throw the fans on full blast. By the time we're done eating, we're ready for third coat. We're gonna switch over to all-purpose compound of that coat. And then hopefully the fans will get that dry within the hour and I'll switch over all my gear, get set up for painting. We should be able to start priming by two o'clock, 2.30. Someone's buying me around. <laughs> all right, here. There you go, nice and hard. Now you'll see the difference. There's some two-tone going on. There's some dry and there's some still working on the dry issue. Here's the, here's the point. Drywall and drywall compound are designed to absorb moisture and then release it again. So even during your construction phase, if it's still holding too much moisture, it's not a negative. It just means that you've got to use a really decent quality drywall sealer when you go to prime your walls. <laughs> All right. Don't buy the cheap one that costs you $10 a gallon. It won't work in this kind of environment, but if you buy something like even the, the I hate to say it, but the Home Depot bare primer is actually pretty decent for drywall. Um, that'll work. Okay. And that's in my experience. I'm not talking on behalf of bear. They might have a different opinion, but my experience that works. Now, what I'm doing right now is instead of sanding, and I've seen a lot of people talk about drywall and you sand between coats. And if you put way too much mud on the wall, yeah, sand it off. But if you're drywalling like I am, this is all you gotta do for preparation. Get rid of any bumps and ridges, okay? Identify areas like this that need to be pressed in with the heel of the, all right, to create a little bowl. Now when I come back, I can fill that. All right, just get rid of any ridges. No sanding necessary. This is preparation. And then we're gonna be ready to go to the next mud. And the reason I do this is so I can go with less mud when I come back, right? If you get ridges off, there's less to fill. So if everything's flat and there's a bump, you gotta fill all of that space. So by getting rid of the ridges, you get rid of the need to put so much mud on the wall. It's difficult to use this tip, but if you're not in that much of a rush, here's a tip. After you do your two coats or three coats and you sand it back, if you're not happy, if it doesn't look smooth, prime the wall and then you can do another skim coat. And then when you sand, you can't sand past the paint. And that'll help you eliminate a lot of the problems you're having because it's probably your sanding that's the problem, not the application of the mud. And that will save your bacon. There we go. Now it's gonna be a nice inside corner now. Oh, I'm loving this. Time for next coat. And I found a supplier that says mud in a pail. <laughs> that's awesome. Because uh, it's hard to find good quality pails out there that don't get the chunks of plastic in your mud. So here we go. It's pre-mixed, but you just can't trust it, can you? It's never wet enough. You always gotta add a couple of cups of water in there. And then go really, really slow. Silky smooth. Ah. All right, here we are. Now that's the last bit of mud we're making today. Good, good, good. Here's my pail and I'm gonna work right out of that with my hawk and we're gonna do one more coat and that's it. So the next coat has to be either perfect or good enough to sand off, all right? And that's the limitation we're working with. That is almost as thin as I like it. But because I'm kind of cheating with my second coat, I need to have enough substance in here. I don't want it too thin so that it'll end up bubbling. The thinner, the more water, the more it's prone to bubbling if you put it on too thick. So I, I couldn't go as thin as I want to or it would end up bubbling and I have to do a patch. So this is kind of the provision that you gotta make. You're gonna to have to do just a little bit more sanding, but it eliminates the need for you to do touch-up coat, okay? All right, that's cool. Let's go get our big joints first. We'll see how this mud is looking. All right. 
When I'm working right now, every time I find any piece of dirt, I gotta get rid of it, or it leaves a line, okay? So I'm gonna use lots of pressure, make sure that it's clean, and then see how I got a divot here? I can't fix that with pressure. Wipe in a little mud. Okay, I like that. Yep, that can be sanded. There we go, I like the mud. I think we're gonna be okay. All right, now listen, if you wanna learn how to use these tools, which I think are far superior to that flexible blade with the handle in the middle look, whoever invented that was looking for a way to do this without having the skills. This gives you a better look every day of the week. And if you think I'm wrong, feel free to hit up the section of the comments. But if you think I'm wrong, you have to tell me you worked on these tools for at least five years and learned how to use them well, or I'm not gonna value your opinion. <laughs> There's some of that dirt I'm talking about, okay? You get that, put it somewhere on your hawk that's separated from the mud. Don't let it become part of the finished product. So this is harder this way to get it perfect. But like I said, as long as I can sand it back and be happy, then I'm gonna have to be happy with it. And this is one of these spots. Okay. Bam, that'll work. Remember, it's really tricky to do this because you're supposed to do joints and corners. They're in different directions. You should do them on separate days traditionally with drywall. So when you're doing them all the same time, multiple coats a day, you gotta adjust how you're working and leave a ridge that can be sanded off. That's really all there is to it, all right? Leave a little extra work to do with the sanding and that'll save you a day of letting it dry and then recoating. Because at this point in the day, I don't know why that was dry. At this point in the day, if we have to do one more coat, there's no way you're finishing, right? We still have three coats of paint, one primer and two finish to put on. There's no room for not having enough mud or you're just gonna run out of daylight. Okay. Whoa, chunks of junk. In my mud. I have not used this mud before. I bought it because it came in a pail and the mix is very inconsistent. Not happy with that. Bloody hell. I picked the wrong day to experiment with a new mud, eh? Okay, I'm back at it. So my favorite mud is still machine mud. <laughs> Never have this problem with my machine mud. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. This is just a quality control issue at the plant, and I'm not happy. But hey, if you never try new things, you're never gonna know, right? Bloody hell. Okay. And that will all sand just fine. Okay, so now it's just a waiting game for the mud. And that is relative humidity, how much wind you've got blowing, if you have the dehumidifier capacity, which I don't hear today. It is now 10 to two. So we've been at it for three hours and we've had a lunch break. So we've got all of our drywall installed. We've got all three coats done. I'm really happy with the progress so far. Unfortunately, in the weather condition today, it might be another hour before I can actually sand and prime and paint. Um, having said that, it's just two walls. Right? So, uh, yeah, I'm still feeling pretty comfortable. We're gonna be done today on time. Okay, quick update. It is 3.30, and we're having the mother of all storms outside right now. So, <laughs> we were hoping to be able to open the windows because a storm came through about an hour ago, and 
we were gonna open the windows because there was nice dryer on the other side. But it is so humid in here right now. A, it's summertime in Ottawa, we're in a valley, it's, pen it's a peninsula, it's humid. The new weather was gonna be nice, we would have changed the air, this would have been dry by now with all the fans going, but I don't have a dehumidifier, so I'm stuck. It's raining again now, <sighs> we're gonna call it a day. This is gonna be another hour or so before it's dry in the current conditions, and that takes it far too late. So we're gonna pick this up in the morning, and we'll finish there. And it looks like I owe my son a round of golf because <laughs> Had it been nice and dry, or a normal sunny day without the rain, uh, I would have had no problem getting this done, all right? Um, from the point that I start sanding and painting, this sucker's done in less than two hours. I'd have been out of here at 5.30, and I would have won the bet, but hey. Hey guys, welcome back. It's the next day. I have almost completely finished sanding already, and that's because I'm trying to be conscious of the camera guy. He's got expensive equipment, right? Here's the thing. Um, Yes, I failed getting it all done in one day, but we started at 11, we finished up at 3.30, and we really finished at 2.30, but we hung around for an hour to see if that mud would dry in time. Because of the weather, I'm back here today now that it's all dry. I've sanded most of this already this morning, and so I am officially, we're gonna call out about two hours left in an eight hour day, all right? Not a big deal. If you start this Saturday afternoon project, you can finish it up Sunday morning before lunch. That's what you really need to know. What is the fastest way to get the project done? And this is it, so I'm gonna show you the rest of my system. And it really is key is the sanding block. Let's get right up here and take a look at this. Because if you remember, we did a flat tape up against the ceiling, up against the wall, all right? And all of this mud is just filling in the divot. So you wanna hold it right up square against the paint job. Because this is existing paint, it's not gonna scratch like it is if it, was, as if it was just regular drywall mud. So we can actually go like this, right? And get a nice clean edge up against the ceiling. All right, that's really the whole system. Outside of that, it's like every other painting video I do. I use the sanding sponge to feather in the joints, okay? Right there, and then I'm gonna use the radius sander to finish changing the texture of all the mud so that the paper and the mud have about the same texture. That way when you prime, you get a great finish. So I'm gonna jump into the priming right now, and then I'm gonna show you how, what product to use to seal this joint so it never cracks. Priming, use a 15, maybe a 20 millimeter roller, uh, half inch Imperial, okay? And you're gonna wanna use a little bit of pressure here. This is not like finished paint. Finished paint, you let gravity do most of the work. When you're priming, you actually wanna be pushing this in, okay? This is a sealer. So you actually wanna be pushing this into the wall board. A little bit of pressure. Not so much that you're gonna cause a bunch of nail pops, but a little bit of pressure doesn't hurt here. When you prime, you always prime first and then you cut. You don't wanna waste your time doing a really nice cut because chances are you're only gonna need like two inches. But you wanna use the brush to finalize everything that didn't get sealed. I like to roll first when I'm in a hurry because that way the paint from the roller has time to dry. And then I can do my cutting and then the wall is usually dry enough that I can get my first sanding coat. Don't forget we're gonna prime and then sand and then paint and then sand and then, oh my God, paint again. Here we go. Of course, if you're not familiar with my rules for painting, use the cage, that's pointing in the direction you're heading, okay? And that works right up until you get to the end of the wall and then you gotta switch it around because you want to have this end as close to the corner as you can get to reduce the amount of brushwork you're going to do. All right, so we'll switch hands. We're going to get as close as we can get here without making a mess on the other wall. Remember the goal here is to do this work without affecting the other surfaces so it reduces the overall scope of work. And that is the value right there. Okay, first line we're going to get close to the ceiling and then we're gonna push it up a little bit right into the crack, okay? There we go. Don't get paint on the ceiling, just on the drywall. This takes a little bit of practice, but you can go past two or three times and eventually push that paint right into that crack. 
as long as you're painting from inside the brush and not the surface. Okay. And if you come a little bit shy, that's fine. Remember, we're going to be using a little be thin bead of caulking up here. And that is going to be the secret. And I'm going to show you which caulking to use because not all caulking is made the same. Every product on the market has a specific purpose. So, in this case, we have to use the right product for this purpose or we're going to run ourselves into trouble. If you're not going to do the traditional inside corner taping, you sure better use a superior product for this situation to avoid having issues down the road. There's no sense doing it fast if it's not going to last. Now we've got to give that about 20 minutes and I'll come back and I'll show you the next step. All right, next step in my system. And let's get a good close up of this, okay? You'll see it, it's a regular caulking, but it's a crown molding caulking. Basically what we call is a siliconized caulking, okay? It's an acrylic caulk, which can be painted with acrylic paints. So it's water-based, but it has silicone technology in it. And they found a way to bind them together. So this way you get um, a quick, simple application, but it also has a flexibility, so it won't crack, all right? Now, now that we got the flexibility worked out in an interior caulking, we're not gonna have nasty off gases. I'm gonna go with a nice small hole on a 45 degree angle, okay? We'll pop it in there. And we're gonna wanna apply this caulking with a technique where my angle is also on an angle. So I'm pushing it out just ahead of the tube and then snow plowing behind it to create a nice flat surface because I don't want to have to use my finger or any other tools to clean this up. Remember, we don't want to get this all over the ceiling. So you want to be uh, less is more in this scenario, okay? If you have to do it twice, that's fine. But uh, here goes everything. Actually, let's just start it right down here until we see it coming out. There we go. Now we know we're good to go. Okay, so we're running into a problem because the paint is not quite dry yet. All right, and so it's actually scratching things up. We're just too ambitious. Got to give it another 10 minutes before we do this. All right, enough time has gone by. I just need an extra 10 or 15 minutes, not a big deal. All right, here we go. Now, if you can't get a perfect application like this and you need to, make sure you use a clean finger and go nice and quick. All right, with pressure on the ceiling so that you don't get any buildup. And it'll wipe off that paint just fine. There we go. Oh. All right. Ah. There we go. That's it. Wipe it off on the caulking gun. All right, here we go. And down this side where we flat taped, same thing. We don't have a choice. We've got to have a bead of caulking here, all right? And that'll be our cut line as well. So here we go, we have it primed, it's dried, I've done the caulking. Next step is take your radial sander, all right? And you're going for basically sanding all the flat areas. We're just looking for debris at this point. There's always a little bit of dust when you sand and we're not really looking to sand down the dust that was trapped in the paint because that becomes part of the paint when you paint. But we are looking for chunks of debris, things in the atmosphere, animal hair flying around. But more importantly, sometimes you open a used paint can, you're gonna have little chunks of dried paint in it. And if you get those on your finished surface that cast a shadow, and so since you can't see it right now, here, there's one right there, a little bugger. All right, can you see that there? See the difference? Gone. Problem solved, right? So since you can't see all the imperfections where you're standing, just give the whole surface of the wall a good sand. Try to prep all of that so that you aren't gonna have an issue with your finished coat. Now, for the sake of saving some time, I know I always preach to cut and then roll. You have to do that on the second coat. 
because what you're doing is you're going to be rolling over your brush lines to add texture, to make them less visible. But on the first coat, it's okay to roll first. And since our caulking is still drying, we're going to paint the wall surface. I'm using my favorite paint again, C2. This is a more econ economical version of it. It's just a simple flat paint. Um, I'm going for occupancy, right? Not painting Taj Mahal. Here we go. We're just gonna get a coat on here. All right. Ah, that was nice. Matt turned off the fan because it was awfully noisy. But the fact is you're probably gonna be working with a fan on your back the entire time you're trying to do an eight hour challenge. You know, there we go. Let me get this done. We'll do the first coat. We'll show you the next step. One of the things that caulking does in the corner is it gives you a straight line to run your brush up against. And if there's a little bit left that doesn't get painted, it doesn't hurt anybody, right? So we're gonna get it close, just like with the primer. And then we're gonna push it right into the caulking line. Let the brush do the work. You don't even have to be good at this. Having a little bit of caulking is that's it. You know, it's, anybody can paint a line up against the ceiling if you put a bit of caulking there first. So not only is it a great cheat for a fast job, it's a great cheat for any job. Okay, once the paint has dried for at least 25 to 30 minutes, just give it another quick sand. Not too much pressure, just looking for little chunks of dirt like that that came off of the roller. Second cut. The next step is your final roll, all right? Now, if you're in a place where you're doing baseboards as well, you can either attach them after you're done with adhesive, make sure they're pre-painted, and then add a little bit of siliconized caulk at the end. That way you can avoid having to paint it on the brand new wall. Or you can install them while you're in between coats and the paint's drying. 